Claudie Catlett was the Hiss's full-time, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in those days, housemaid from 1934 through 1938. And that was all the time that Chambers said he and the Hisses were spies and close friends. During this period, you may recall, Chambers said once every 10 days or so, I'd drop by the Hiss house around 6 o'clock to pick up spy documents. And then after a few hours later, I had them photographed, I would bring them back. Mrs. Catlett took some afternoons off, but she was, always, she was usually there in the evening when Chambers said he'd come by to pick up the documents, and she would have been long gone by the time he, he, he bought them back. But she might have been also at some of the social interactions, which the Chambers is alleged and the Hiss is denied. And Mrs. Catlett testified that she only remembered seeing Chambers once in the Hiss's presence, and that was at the P Street house, where the Hisses lived from June 35 to June 36. Specifically, she said, I remember one evening Chambers appeared at the door and Mrs. Hiss asked him in and told me to make tea for the two of them. Chambers, she testified, called himself Crosby or maybe Crosley or maybe Carl or Carlton or Crofton or some other name and was not well dressed. She said that was the only time she ever saw Chambers. Now you'd think if he was at the Hiss house once every 10 days when Mrs. Catlett was there, she would have seen him more often. And these re recollections, of course, are consistent with the Hiss's story that Chambers was a minor character in their lives who they'd pretty much gotten rid of by the end of uh, 35. On cross-examination, however, she said that she had very little memory of any people who'd called on the Hisses. She had no memory of any of their names except for this one guy, Chambers Crosby, and she gave about eight different names for him, and that her memory that Chambers called himself Crosby was recent. Then came the Catlett kids. They were Raymond and Perry, the neighborhood handymen who, who helped the Hisses move. They testified at great length because, remember, the Hisses had said that when the typewriter, when the spy documents were typed on their old typewriter, it was in the Catlett kids' possession. Now, they testified that they got the Woodstock the Hiss Home typewriter, from the Hisses as part of one of the Hisses moves. And again, they were very vague. They said it could have been the move to this place in 36 or the move to Volta Place in 37. Now, if the Catlett kids got the typewriter in 37, the Hisses didn't have it anymore when the spy documents were typed on it. And that pretty much lets the, cat, that, that lets the Hisses off the hook, doesn't it? At least as to the type documents, they still have to deal with the four handwritten notes and the uh, pumpkin papers. But there were problems with the Catlett kids' testimonies, and the first, I'm afraid, sort of racial. These are black people in their 20s at the time of the trials testifying in court in America uh, that was still pretty rigidly segregated, and black people were just beginning to get their full rights. And the Catlett kids had grown up in Washington that was a very southern uh, city and rigidly segregated. Here they are in New York, hundreds of miles from home, in a court surrounded by powerful white people and being asked to remember the precise day when they got a typewriter 10 years ago. In my brief career as a litigator in the early 1980s, a few times I had people of this vintage, black people of this vintage, who, who grew up at the time and the kind of times and places that Catlett kids did, and they were often awful witnesses because they would, given where they grew up, they would tell the white man who was asking them questions whatever they thought he wanted to hear. And they'd, when I was questioning them, they'd say, oh, Mr. Beresford, your client had the green light. And when the next guy was questioning them, they'd say, oh, Mr. Smith, your client had the green light. I was wrong what I said to Mr. Beresford. Um, and this is what seems to have happened with the Catlett kids. They made a lot of inconsistent or contradictory statements about when they got the typewriter. Sometimes they couldn't remember at all. Sometimes they were sure they got it in connection with the move in 1936 to 30th Street, but that can't be true because Mrs. Hiss typed two of the Hiss standards on the typewriter in May 37. Other times the Catlett kids were sure they got it at the time of the move to Volta Place, December 29. That's still good news for the Hisses because the spy documents were typed in 38. Other times they said uh, to either to the FBI interviewed them many times, uh, they got it in, in connection with one of these moves, in connection, maybe before, maybe after. And yet other times, the Catlett kids said they could have got the Hiss Home typewriter several months after, several months after the Hisses move to Volta Place, 
maybe, they said, in April 1938. And if that's when they got it, that's bad news for the Hisses, because that means the typewriter was still in the Hiss home when the spy documents were typed on it. Their mother, Mrs. Catlett, remembered seeing the typewriter in the Volta Place home. So from all these statements, take your pick. Concerning the April 1938 date, it was hard for me to grasp why you would give somebody a big old typewriter as part payment for helping you move several months after you completed the move. This is the kind of big thing you'd give them on moving day so you don't need to lug it to your new house. Unless there's some other reason the Hisses would give the, cat, would give the Catlett kids the typewriter in April 1938. What else happened in April 1938? That's when Chambers defected from the underground. And maybe the Hisses thought, they, they found out about this and went, oh my God, all that stuff we typed up on the typewriter, how do we get rid of the typewriter? Well, we could carry it across the key bridge and dump it into the, now somebody might see it. Well, we could give it to the salvation. Now papers get signed, somebody might buy it. How can we make this thing disappear? Give it to the Catlett kids. They'll leave it in the backyard, it'll di disintegrate. Well, the Catlett kids were very uncertain about when they got the typewriter, but they were certain about a few other things. The first thing they were certain of was they'd never seen Chambers until this whole scandal broke and in the grand jury and that sort of thing. Second thing they were sure of, when they got the Woodstock, the His Home typewriter, they took it right to where they were living at 2728 P Street near where the Hisses lived in Georgetown. Now this house, 2728 P Street, still stands, uh, and there's a front door from which you enter the house on P Street, and from P Street south to the river, the land drops off sharply. And if you go to the back of the house, what is the ground floor in the front is sort of the second story, and there's a whole new floor you can see from the back that opens onto an alley it's the basement. This bottom floor has its own door in the back which opens onto the back alley. Well in this basement that you enter from the back of the house, the Catlett kids, who remember were teenagers when they got the typewriter, they had a den or a back room in which they had a kind of non-stop dance party going on, presumably for other black teenagers in the neighborhood. And there was a lot of testimony from the Catlett kids about what exactly went on in this den Sometimes they had electricity, they said, sometimes just kerosene. They had a radio in which they liked to listen to a guy named Jackson Lowe. They had a record player. There was an old musket mounted on one wall. There were two crossed swords mounted on another wall. Sometimes they had hot dogs and potato salad. I imagine you might be, for a dollar, you might be able to get something to drink or smoke. There were a couple of chairs in case you got tired of dancing. Raymond testified sometimes it would be so crowded you couldn't even get around. Also in the den was a box on which they put the Hiss home typewriter. They said sometimes it was in a closet or an upstairs bedroom, but most of the time it was in the den, maybe sort of early pop art. They said the only time they ever typed on it was when they typed their names on it. Now. Consider that, what that means. If what the Hisses testified is true, and the typewriter was in the Catlett kids' den, dance party going on, when the spy documents were typed on it, it must be that Chambers decided to frame Hiss in 1948 by faking forged documents that he'd produced 10 years later. Somehow, in 1938, Chambers found out the typewriter was in the Catlett kids' den, and one day there's a dance party going on and the smoke is thick and the smell of hot dogs fills the air and all the black teenagers are doing whatever dances those folks were doing in 38 and suddenly Chambers joins the dance. This 40-year-old white man who stinks to high heaven and is fat and is missing half his teeth blends in with these black teenagers so perfectly that nobody remembers ever having seen him. And, uh, I guess chamber, as the conga line passes the typewriter, Chambers types up the document. This is what I think you have to believe if you believe that the spy documents were typed on the, on the Hiss Home typewriter after the Hisses gave it to the Catlett kids. 
And as we'll see, Prosecutor Murphy had a lot of fun with this at the second trial. Back to the issue of when the Catlett kids got the Hiss Home typewriter. Uh, great efforts were made to resolve that by means other than their wandering memories. When did the Catlets move to 2728 P Street? That would be the first day they could have gotten it from the Hisses because they said we took it right there. Uh, the Catlets, unfortunately, were very vague about this. They said, gee, we could have moved there in 36. It might have been 37, might have been 38. There was another black man, however, named George Rulak, who'd lived there at 2728P. Apparently, there were a lot of people living there. He was the guy who actually signed the lease on the place. He was a sergeant in the Army in 1950, and they flew him down from Alaska to testify. And he said, I signed the lease. I remember exactly when we moved in there, the middle of January 1938. Now, that would make it impossible for the Catlett kids to have taken the typewriter before that. Supporting his memory were the records of the electric company, which showed that the Catlets had electricity turned on at 2728P and turned off at their previous residence on January 17. And Sergeant Rulak said, we had electricity from the first day we were there, never had kerosene. So January 17, 1938, the first date the Hiss Home typewriters could have been the cool new thing at the Catlett Kids dance party. Rulock also testified that he remembered seeing the Hiss Home typewriter for the first time three months after they moved in, which would be April 38. He said that he saw it out in the hallway on the washing machine near the infamous back room or den. And this would have the Hiss Home typewriter back with the hisses when the spy documents were typed on it. Frankly, I find that recollection a little hard to believe. I doubt that I would remember 10 years later exactly the first time and place I saw a typewriter that didn't mean anything to me at the time. But The third and final thing that the Catlett kids were sure of, and this shows you how exhaustive this trial was, by the way, the third and sure thing, the thing they were sure of that might prove when they got the typewriter was they said that when they got it, it was not in good working order. And pretty soon after they got it, when the weather was warm, Perry Catlett took it to a typewriter repair shop. Which typewriter repair shop? One in downtown Washington at the northwest corner of Connecticut and Kay, or maybe on Kay near Connecticut, on the ground floor. The first day that store opened would be pretty soon after the Catlets got the typewriter. This turned out to be mostly bad news for the Hiss defense. There was a lot of real estate agents who testified about when various typewriter repair shops opened and closed. Uh, the first day that each opened would be the first day the Catlett kids could have taken it there would be pretty soon after they got it from the Hisses when the weather was warm. One store opened in May 1938. That has the typewriter with the Hisses when the spy documents were typed. Another, a Woodstock shop, no less, on the corner of Connecticut and Kay, but on the second floor. The kids said it was on the ground floor. That opened in September 38. That's consistent with the Catlett kids getting the typewriter after the spy documents were typed on it, meaning the, sp the typewriter was with the hisses when the spy documents were typed. But there were two glimmers of hope for the Hiss defense. Another typewriter repair shop had been opened near there as early as January 38, and there had been a Woodstock shop a block and a half away from Connecticut and Kay at 1528K that early, too. If either of those was the shop Perry was talking about, they could have po he could have possibly gotten the typewriter before the spy documents were typed on it. So as with many aspects of this case, there were versions that are helpful to the hisses and probably the more credible versions are harmful to them. And that, in essence, is the hiss defense at the first trial. Next, the summations and the outcome. The last chance you'll have to hear Lloyd Paul Stryker. You don't want to miss it. <laughs>